Good morning, everyone. Good morning. At least one minute to noon, so it is still morning. The Lord is good. And all the time, I'm really delighted this morning to be a new life church, a church I cherish a lot. As uh, Pastor Emmanuel has said, this is where my children and now my grandchildren have grown up for many years. They were here members before they got married. They got married in this church. And then they have got uh, their children. They are also worshipping here. And I want to thank a New Life Church for that kind nature that you are giving to my family and my wife's family. Even as we go around and serve this church, uh, I want to thank uh, Pastor Emmanuel and the South Nairobi Kajiado. I am actually here by invitation. I didn't uh, come here. So I want to thank you that uh, when I was invited through Pastor Unchana, he told me he must go and attend to the various duties of the field. But he told me I will send my colleague and Pastor Emmanuel, thank you very much. Pastor Emmanuel is not uh, new to you. He just got appointed as the executive secretary of the union of the South Nairobi Kajiado, replacing Pastor Mobel, who has since moved to the union level as VOP director. And so, uh, thank you very much for your uh, introduction. Pastor Akali and uh, your other colleagues, I want to thank you very much for inviting me uh, this Sabbath, Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Sabbath. And uh, uh, when they asked me, I said, yes, I will come. And we shall share what the word of God says about religious, public affairs and religious liberty. I want to thank Tom, uh, who happens to be a PK, uh, a son to uh, the late retired, retired but late pastor, Jameson Getanke. And I was reminding him that uh, Getanke is the one who registered our wedding 39 years ago. So uh, I have very close, very close touch. Uh, he's the one who brought us together by registering our wedding. So we want to thank uh, him. And what I realized when he called his colleagues here, I said, wow, uh, what is going to happen when we shall uh, start what we call Adventist Lawyers Association. If New Life has this number and Central has that number and other churches, in the entire union we are going to have a long, long list of Adventist Lawyers Association. Thank you very much. Uh, all those lawyers who came here, those practicing, those in school and preparing for this uh, uh, noble profession, I want to thank you very much. And I want to thank the church for many things, but one particular one, the attention you give to children. This is commendable. These children are living in an environment that is very oppressive, that is very confusing, that is very persecuting. So when you prepare them this way, then they are prepared to go out in a cruel world and stand. So I don't take for granted, thank you very much, the teachers and uh, uh, those who guide these young children as they grow up. I enjoyed it and I said, what if we took the entire 12 hours, 24 hours of the Sabbath just uh, seeing and infusing into our children the morals and uh, the ethics and the life of the church. I was told this story. No, no, no. I read it. I read it. That uh, a zebra gives birth in the open. 
amidst many, many enemies, elephants, hyenas, and I don't know, how, not the elephants, but uh, lions. I don't know how lions know that that zebra is going to give birth. So they, they surround it. And uh, I read that story. It was a research that this zebra gives birth to a baby and must stay for the first three minutes so that the baby can see the stripes of a mother because there's no one zebra which has got exact strips. So it is important for the first three minutes of the birth of baby zebra to look and know the mother carefully because our life, our existence depends on identifying the mother. If it makes a mistake and goes to suck the wrong mother, it is kicked to death. So very important. So I read that story and it was written from the children's department and said it's good for the church to give these children time to study the patterns of this church, the strips of this church, so that when they go out there, they are not attracted by the strips of other churches. So that's why I say it is important, and I want to recognize it that uh, um, uh, you, have, you are doing very well for the children and um, having time. At least I know in this union, uh, several churches which give very special attention to children and New Life Church, 5th Ngong Avenue, is one of them. Thank you very much for the leadership. And those who have offered to give that children that picture. Uh, another one is the choir. Thank you very much, choir. Uh, you know, it's one of the few choirs which sing a cappella, you know, that's a music language. A capella is a singing without instruments. And uh, very few churches uh, have choirs which sing a capella, which sing without instruments. Because people have become so slave, enslaved to uh, instruments, to music, so that if an electricity just goes, they cannot sing. But I, I enjoyed the song, very good one. I also was uh, um, uh, in the choir, in the college, and Pastor Carl can testify many, many years ago. Uh, I don't know what I was doing well. I know uh, training and singing in the choir needs the highest discipline possible. So thank you very much, choir. And all of us, the deacon, the deaconesses, the elders, and all who have uh, decided to serve this time. Before I embark on what brought me here, let me say one thing, that we have what we call a strategy in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, a mission. And we want to introduce it whenever we have opportunity like this. Uh, for you who know this church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we have uh, plans for every five years, and we call those five years a quinquennium. So uh, we started a quinquennium in 2015 and was supposed to end in 2020, but you know what was there in 2020, it just disturbed the pattern and gave the new quinquennium two years. It ate into the quinquennium two years. And so, this time, there were elections last year, but they can't work in three years. They have three years to implement the five years plans. So it is still a quinquennium. Only that it will be squeezed in three years. 
So during this quinquennium, we have a slogan, a song that we need to have, children need to have, and youth have to have, and then the adults of every description and profession and whatever station of life. And it says like this, Mission Impact 2025. No, I've told you, sir, Quinquinium. Mission Impact 2025, and you say, double our membership. Very simple. That's the strategy. And that's why we are putting it in a very simple slogan so that even children can have it and apply themselves. Our church boards, our departmental councils, our executive committees of fields and conferences and union and division, the general conference, should apply themselves under that strategy. So let's uh, have it. And I want you to shout uh, until when I begin the sermon, even the sermon will wake up. Now, Mission Impact 2025. No, no, I think uh, that is a little bit weird. Uh, Mission Impact 2025. Double our membership. Yeah, now every church is challenged that by 2025, in these three years where we have got to do that, we must harness ourselves that we double our membership. And let me tell you that. If that is our strategy, that is our vision, let me tell you the facts. We cannot double the membership at the union level. We can't. The union has only about 35 workers. We cannot double the membership at the conference or field level and as for your case, it's field level. No, it has a few hundreds of workers. The actual doubling of members is going to happen in the local church. A local church like New Life and New, like others in the field and in all of these other conferences. So this slogan, this vision must be cast in the local church here. And let me tell you how it is apportioned. It's apportioned that uh, for us to double the membership 2025, we must baptize a third of the population this year. Another, another third next year. And another third 2025. And we shall have surpassed the doubling of the membership. So that is how it is. So for us to do that, we have come up with a, a yearly slogan. And the slogan for this year is Jesus is coming soon, get involved. Jesus is coming soon, get involved. So that is now coming to individuals. We are calling and rallying everybody to get involved in one form of ministry or another. Even the union has prepared a very small booklet that should be brought in this church. And as many of us buy it and see the activities and then reorganize this church into those small groups as many as possible and ask everyone, children, youth, uh, adults to get involved in one form of ministry or another. And by doing that, then we shall realize the vision uh, double our membership. And I think uh, that one will be coming from the field, from the church. Pastors are there. We are selling the, the, the vision. And I know that uh, your field is so receptive. It must have even introduced it to some of you, some elders, the pastors. And it's coming. If it has not come, it's coming. Now, today is Sabbath. In uh, school, the children are taught, they say, know your county. Know your county. That's the history they are taught. They begin with their county. Know it. And we also want to say, in church, 
is good to know your church. Not merely by the name Seventh Day Adventist Church, but know it. And I want to give you just a synopsis of this church called Seventh Day Adventist. It has got two types of script uh, of, of, of structure, organizational structure and administrative structure. It has a vertical structure and a horizontal structure. That's what you need to know about your church. And the pastor will have one, one Sabbath and teach you how to understand your church. So, a, I mean a vertical, a very simple local church, local conference, local union, general conference. Four levels. Vertical. It is, that's how it is structured. Now, horizontal is departments and services and institutions. So that is how it is. It is standing on the base. The vertical uh, structure is standing on the horizontal base. That is departments and, and, uh, and services in the church. That's why you need to also understand this horizontal structure, the structures. And it is because of the horizontal structure that has brought us this Sabbath, the departments. And I want to give you a history up to 1901, from between 1863 to 1901, there were no departments in this church. It only thrived on the vertical structure. But as the church grew, they found, no, we must uh, uh, restructure it to introduce the departments so that the vertical structure can stand and thrive. So 1901, all the way up this time, they have developed departments and services to address the critical aspects of the life and mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And of the many, many departments, we have one that is called public affairs and religious liberty. Public affairs and religious liberty. Or in short, PAL. PAL. P-A-R-L. Public affairs and religious liberty. And so that it gives you certain uh, aspects of this church. They have apportioned, the general conference has apportioned them Sabbaths and days of emphasis. And uh, thank God that of uh, the department, the department of ministerial where revival and reformation is put, the first one, emphasis, is revival and reformation. That's why we have 10 days of prayer to begin and take two Sabbaths. 10 days of prayer and revival. Then the next one is public affairs and religious liberty. It's always the last Sabbath of January of every year. So you don't have to wait for the, um, the, 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 the announcement or, or anything from above. It will be there until it changed. So the last Sabbath of January is public affairs and religious liberty uh, in this church. When those facts are brought before members, you know what they are and we can't finish them. And this morning... Uh, this afternoon, I want to begin uh, doing justice to this Sabbath's assignment. And this time, I want to talk about religious liberty, or liberty as understood by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's so critical that it has created a full-fledged department. It's not even a service. Is a department, full-fledged, with the leaders and associates from the general conference that the division 
at the union, at the conference, and in the local church, a full-fledged department with job descriptions, what you do, your areas. And so, this Sabbath, I chose to talk about the irony of liberty, the irony of freedom. Because what comes to your mind when the word freedom is announced? Freedom is said. What comes to your mind? Maybe slavery. And you desire freedom from it. Maybe restrictions. I want to get freedom from these restrictions. Maybe parameters. That, that wall that puts you and closes you in. That jumps into your mind. Maybe it is containment in institutions. The home. The school. Whether it is primary or secondary or university. Prisons. You know, the army camps. All these things come into your mind. When we speak freedom, we must be speaking from where? Is it from these containment institutions? Is it freedom from schedules? Is it freedom from parameters? Is it freedom from restrictions? These are rules and laws and regulations. This, uh, is it from slavery? What is it from? And we need to understand. It's very, very important. And the church has put that importance until it has created a department. And members must know, yes, we need freedom. But freedom from what? So that you don't do a different thing. Let me tell you how misinterpretation of freedom can lead to disaster. Here is one young man. His story is in the book of Luke chapter 15. Uh, as he was at home, he looked at the home environment with its parameters. There are parents, there are siblings, brothers and sisters. There is the extended family. And then this young man decided, no, I don't like this environment. It is too structured. It's too restricted. And because he defined his home as a restricted environment, a closed environment, he decided to seek freedom, to seek liberty from home. You know, I'm talking about the prodigal son. He said, I don't like these restrictions at home. So I need liberty. He went to his father and announced, I need liberty. And I need those, that liberty and the resources to enjoy it. I want to enjoy it out there, not here. So give me. And the story goes, he just went. And when he thought he was free, actually, that is when he discovered it was disastrous. Thank God he decided to come home and say, I better become contained here rather than seeking freedom from here. So it's very important to know this freedom we are talking in the seventh day Adventist understanding. It is freedom from what? So that when you are seeking, when you are uh, invoking Freedom, your rights to freedom, you are invoking, you are touching the right key. Otherwise, the young man tied the wrong key, he went out and found that this freedom he was seeking has become uh, destructive. And if he had not returned home, it would have taken his life, it would have killed his life. So we want to know, we want to know in this case. That's what we call the irony of liberty. The irony of freedom. And this Bible teaches us that. This is the irony. 
He tells us you are free but you are not free. That's the iron. You are free but you are not free. The freedom is defined differently in the church environment than it is defined in the secular society. That's why it is called, it is restricted to what we call religious liberty. We are not talking about political liberty, political freedom that uh, informed the independence movements, the Mao Mao, the, the political parties, and they went and took ammunitions and fought the Mzungu. They went with the Mau Mau. You know, Mau Mau is a, just a coined word. It's not even Kikuyu. It's not uh, any language. It simply meant in Kiswahili, you know. And you know they had to structure it in such a way that the Mzungu does not know. So Mau Mau is Mzungu, Aende, Uraya, Mwafrika, Apate, Uhuru. So they began those movements. So the kind of freedom we are considering will uh, help you how you rally around that freedom. When the like of Kenyatta announced we want freedom from colonialism, immobilized people, they went into the forests, they did all these things, and they did, and we gained independence. Why must the church not leave? You know, they are not saying freedom. It is saying religious freedom, religious liberty. So we shall limit ourselves not to political liberty or freedom, not to economic freedom, not to philosophical freedom, but to religious liberty. How does the Bible understand religious liberty? And each one of us who have believed in Jesus Christ, whether you are baptized or not baptized, you need to know this liberty. It is by knowing this liberty, then you will know how to have. Liberty, religious liberty that is, is divided into two. I will handle one, then the rest of the department will handle the other. I will handle the one which is not normally emphasized during religious liberty sabbaths and leave the common one uh, which is most emphasized. So these two categories of liberty or religious freedom is this. There is what we call internal religious liberty and external religious liberty. The one which is common to you is external religious liberty. Children in alliance have been forced to go on Sabbath. Okay, can we have our lawyers to go there and invoke uh, I don't know which article of the 2010 constitution and they say the principle, no, you are not doing right. That is external religious liberty. Fighting for the rights, religious rights of our children. Sometimes um, the government has said we are putting a national exercise like elections on Saturday. Then we say, no, 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 no. You are going to limit Adventists from voting. So we send our lawyers and they, they, they file a case and say, now if you do that and they know how to, to collect figures, we tell them we are 670. They will say, no, 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 no. Uh, in Kenya, we are about 3, 000, 3, 3 million Adventists. So if you put that and uh, this number is eligible for voting. So if you put it on Saturday, what's going to happen? That's religious liberty, but external. So we want to know that the church emphasizes these two. The one internal 
is the one which informs the external. An individual has power over the internal but may not necessarily have power of external. You may be living in a, a dictatorial government who will say we don't want to hear anybody worshipping on Saturday, period. There's no, uh, there's, no, there's no court you're going to go, there's no number of lawyers you're going to hire. Sometimes religious oppression may come and we may not have that external. But as much as we have the external, we want to know the internal freedom. And we shall now use our Bible to start this study on the internal and see how it presents a platform to handle the external religious liberty. But you must be very clear. One time, Jesus was talking to a multitude. I don't know how many they were. This is one of those multitudes where numbers are not mentioned. You remember in the Bible, there were numbered multitudes and unnumbered multitudes. This time, it was unnumbered. And this is what Jesus said in John chapter 8. I have begun to explain now internal religious liberty which every person who has believed in Jesus Christ must understand, espouse, apply himself or herself regardless of the station of life or the age or whatever you enjoy any privilege. So after preaching, Jesus had a conversation. But this congregation was really Jewish. They were all drawn from the Jewish nation. In verse 31, Jesus begins to make, uh, to make, uh, to engage himself in a conversation. He said, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. That's how he begins his conversation. So that we, where we get the definition of the internal freedom, we must all seek. This all compulsory. Then verse 32, he went on to say, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Then he triggered a question. He said, no, 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 you are confusing us. You are confusing us. That statement is confusing us. That statement is assigning on us a false status. You are implying things which don't belong to us. Can you clarify? So verse 33, he told them, uh, and they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? That's how now he says, Jesus was talking about freedom. And they were saying, no, 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 we are not slaves. If we trace our ancestry, we have never been slaves to anybody. But this was not true. Anyway, if you knew the history of Israel, they had been slaves to, in Egypt, they had been slaves in uh, Babylon, they had been slaves in Syria. They were there. But you know there are people who would want to start a conversation anyway. So here they are. And they are not being sincere. They say we have never been uh, under the bondage of anyone. How do you say? You know, they were denying reality. Psychologists meet such people everywhere. 
You are sick? Say, no, no, no. I can't accept it. Okay, you are sick. I can't accept it. You know, they deny. These are denial. These are telling them, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Then it introduced a slavery, a captivity. And they came in quickly and said, no, 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 no. You are not right. We have never been slaves. We have never been captives to anyone. How can you say that? Then now Jesus came here and told them there is some fact that you are ignoring. Verse 34, he said this, and Jesus answered them, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. That's what he said. Jesus responded to them. This defensive conversation. Let me tell you, Jesus told them, I assure you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Now let me ask you a question. Then in this case, they denied they were not, they were not slaves. But in Jesus' definition, how many were slaves? I have asked you, how many were slaves? Yes? Talk to me. And Jesus responded, I assure you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. According to Jesus' divination, how many were slaves? All of them. All of them. That's what we call the sin problem. The sin problem enslaved everyone. Whoever comes in this world is a slave to sin. Even mamas who get young children and when they look at them, they just toss them here and call them angels. There are no angels. There is no woman in this world who gives birth to angels. We all give birth to sinners. It's only a matter of time. So this is what he's telling them. That human beings have one problem. And the problem is across the world. It encompasses everyone. It is the slavery of sin. And they said anyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Is a slave. So by definition, anyone who is born of woman is a slave of sin. And in need of liberty, of freedom, that is the primary captivity that Jesus had to do this. And the salvation program surrounds this fact. That whoever sins is a slave of sin. That is the basis of this. And it's a, everyone is a slave of sin. That is why Romans chapter 3, beginning verse 10, he says, All, all, all people have sinned and they come short of the glory of God. That must come out very clear. All, it doesn't matter. You, are a, you have 10 degrees of a university or you do not have even a certificate, you are a dropout, you are a woman, you are a man, you are a judge member, you are a pastor, you are a person, you know all these designations we put, we are all put in under one level by the sin problem. That's what Romans say. It says, all have sinned. No one is doing the right thing. All of us are leveled, leveled by sin. 
So he says them here, don't comfort yourselves. Yes, you have titles. Yes, you are uh, dressed in good suits. Yes, you are in good dresses, best grooming in the city, but you have one problem. And that problem is the slavery of sin. You are a captive. You are taken captive. And the history of captivity goes back to Genesis chapter 3 when Satan came and tempted Eve. Did God say you cannot eat any of the fruits? And then she engaged in a conversation. You know what went uh, um, uh, along? And it says, and when Eve saw that this fruit was good to the eyes, and, the, and it can make one nice. She stretched her hand and picked it and ate. And she took another to her husband. That is, just don't worry of the blame game. The woman made the husband fall. Then there's a debate. Uh, if the man had the brains, why didn't he stand firm? And all this. That is not the point. The point is she ate and they gave to Adam and they ate and they made themselves captives. And that's what we call the sin problem. That is what is called the internal. The internal nature of man is that of a fallen nature that is in captivity. That is in slavery. That's what he was telling them that the externals should not deceive you. The internal reality is you are a captive. You are a slave to your desires. You are a slave to your eyes. You are a slave to your nose. You are a slave to your ears. You are a slave to your tongue. You have a problem. And you need to understand that. That's what we call the internal freedom. And because Everyone became a captive by choice. And another thing that is very interesting is we became captives to sin by choice. Genesis chapter 3 does not say that the, 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 the devil overpowered the woman and pushed her. He didn't pick the, the, the fruit and gave her. No, 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 no. He worked around our choice. And the woman worked around the choice of Adam. So we, we became slaves. We became captives by choice. And so we closed ourselves. We put ourselves in prison. Where Satan now became a master. And began to teach us things that are contrary to God's syllabus. All the negative things that we, we do as human beings is because we became captives. We put our, under ourselves a master general, a teacher who is teaching us all these things because stealing is not in the syllabus of God. It's in the syllabus of Satan. And because we put ourselves under that captivity, we learn how to steal. Nothing negative is in the syllabus of God. It's because we put ourselves under the captivity of sin. So he tells them here. And now, when he told them that, he silenced them. He said, and Jesus answered them. Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And they knew this. Why? Because in the chapter, uh, uh, you know, the Bible is not written uh, sequentially, but uh, when you read that woman, caught in adultery and they brought her and then he began to write on the ground 
those people who have committed like sins. The Bible tells us they went one by one. They discovered, oh, I am a slave of sin. He went away. A slave of sin, he went away. Until the sinner remained there. You know, those things had been there. That's why they were silenced. They accepted, yes, we are there. And they said, now, if you want to survive, whether in this world or in the world to come, you must be liberated. And that sin, the end of it is death. Because Paul later wrote that the wages of sin is death. So if you live that life up to the end, death is the natural consequence. However, he told them that, uh, thank God, there is a way out. Around this slavery, by choice, God designed a plan, and that's what we call the salvation plan, the redemption plan. And it is written in verse 35, 36. But let me read verse 35 before we say how Jesus offered that solution. It says verse 35, he says, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides. Now, he declares this. I don't know whether you have ever read John 8, 36. It is one of the most revolutionary verses of all in the human society. Now, he said you are in a big problem. Nobody can rescue you from there. People can push you there. Satan can push you there. All creatures, circumstances, environments have the ability to push you there. But there is only one, one outlet. And this outlet is in there, chapter 8, verse 36. If it is displayed before you as I see here, and you are reading from your Bible, can we all read that verse? One, two, three. Therefore, if the Son sets you free, get that one. Now it tells them, Live about arguments. Arguments is not going to release you. It's not going to give you religious freedom. No. It is only one way. And that way is through Jesus Christ. He says, therefore, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So the internal freedom follows captivity. We put ourselves into captivity by choice. And God had to come up with a very complicated and expensive plan called the plan of salvation. He found an agent to work out that. And an agent is his colleague, is equal in the Godhead in the name of Jesus Christ. He went through a very complicated, very difficult to understand, incomprehensible program called incarnation. He became a human being. He lived with us here in the nature of humanity without committing sin until he was put on the cross and said, it is finished. And so he opened the way that people can be set free. Set free from slavery. Not all kinds of slavery, but from the slavery of sin. The sin that takes you to eternal death. So this is the good news. That while we are sinners, slaves, 
captives of sin by choice of our parents and by birth from the descent of those parents. We have only one opening and that is Jesus Christ. That is why it says now Jesus is in the business of giving people religious liberty. And that's the liberty of slavery of sin. Let me tell you, when Jesus came here to do the job, he said this, Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. He puts very quickly what he was coming to do. And you will see that it is a comprehensive redemption plan, rescue plan. And he says here, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Anointed here means he has set me aside. He has identified me to deal with this problem of slavery and captivity. So the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me, one, to preach the gospel to the poor, two, to heal the broken hearted. So one of the things Jesus came to our freedom is from brokenness of heart. The sin into which we put ourselves breaks our heart. Breaks our heart through divorce and uh, mistreatment and death in a family. You know, like uh, we, 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 are, we are mourning our former CS and today the brother is being buried uh, the, the CS is here in the funeral home. You know, to the, to, the, to, the, to the relatives, there's broken hearts. Last year, the other son died. Now there's only remaining one, very old. You know, there's a lot of brokenness. Somebody who came here and somebody promised all his life and love, after two years, they said it is over. Here is a piece of paper. It is called divorce certificate. Somebody is broken here. So he's saying I am bringing freedom from brokenness of heart. This is what he's saying. This is what I'm coming to address. I'm going to bring freedom from brokenness of heart. My brother, my sister, are you, is your heart broken for one thing or another or out of rejection, out of oppression and other things? You mean uh, unfulfilled dreams and your heart is broken don't worry Jesus promises freedom from brokenness of heart another thing here he says and to proclaim liberty to captives this one brings many captivities it makes some slaves to drugs slaves to pornography slaves to all these kinds of uh, watching dirty things. You know, I was telling others, you see somebody sleeping in a church, there could be many legitimate reasons and many illegitimate reasons. One of them, if it's a, a, a mama, the child may have decided to cry the whole night. Okay? Cry the whole night. And mama could not say, well, tomorrow is Sabbath, you keep crying, I have, I'm sleeping. She will, she will get awake. And so she will, she will toss in the church because the child denied her sleep. That's legitimate. It could be somebody has lived here for eight years and the age is catching upon him. So whenever he sits, he takes a nap. That's legitimate. That is why, pastors, we should not be uh, shouting at people when they sleep. But the others, the others who sleep because they were watching Nigerian movies, which begins at midnight and goes all the way. You keep changing from this uh, to that one, you are watching pornography, you are watching Nigerian styles, you are watching all these things where people pass through fire and they go there, they die and they resurrect. 
They are teaching you wrong doctrine and you are watching. It is 2 o'clock. It's 3 o'clock. It's 4 o'clock. And you remember at 5 o'clock it is Sabbath. And you sleep. Of course you will doze. That's illegitimate. You have become a captive of watching those dirty things. And Jesus says, I have come to proclaim freedom from those captivities. Captivity of drugs, young people, addictions of every description. Computer. You know computer. Somebody is here and food is here. And uh, it's, uh, it's, that's when he's getting all these things and uh, stretches to get food and uh, goes beyond the plate. And you are doing all these things. God is saying, I declare freedom that, from that captivity. You will know there is time for everything. There's a time to eat. There's a time to look at the computer. There's a time to sleep. Jesus is promising liberty, true liberty here from captivity of every description. And every person has got some addiction, some captivity. And Jesus is saying, I came so that I can proclaim freedom from captives. I am come so that I can declare freedom from blindness. The recovery of the sight of the blind. I have come to declare liberty to the oppressed. There are very many things which oppress people. Some beyond their, their control, some within their control, some because of poor choices. You know we are oppressed by things which arise from poor choices in life. Of course there are other oppressions which are beyond our circumstances. But God is saying, I'm going to declare freedom to that. And on and on. So it says, it is this program of God that he came here to deal with what we call spiritual freedom. The one which Satan implanted here, captivities, wrong things, slavery to sin, of every description, now Jesus says, I'm setting you free. You become a really free religious individual. Inside, we are talking about salvation. We are talking about Christianity. Christianity is about freedom from sin and all its captivities. And you here, you are now here, a free person, but inside. This is the one which is going to determine how you are going to endure the external restrictions of freedom. How did people, the first disciples, were able to spend years and years in jail and yet, like Paul, and yet say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now a crown of righteousness which my righteous judge shall give me not only to me but to all who believe. You know, how do people like that make such lofty statements if they had not enjoyed internal freedom? Freedom from sin and it's slavery. And that is what I am dealing with that when you really enjoy freedom from sin, you have gone to Jesus Christ. He has set you free from any addiction, whether it is of food or clothes or what, you know. Uh, uh, there are people who are so addicted, they, then they, when, whenever they have money, they are thinking of buying a cloth. They don't think of anything. You buy, you reach home and say, why did I buy these clothes anyway? Hey, I don't know. Tupauko. Others, kila mtu anayo, yo, yo, shida yo. So God is saying, I have come so that I can deliver you. I can give you liberty. I can give you freedom. That's basic. That's basic uh, of that. 
Let me uh, go to the book of Romans chapter 6. Where now the irony comes in. Another fact you need to know about this life is human beings were taught to be under a master. Never independent. This kind of uh, divination which brings this uh, uh, irresponsible freedom eh? like the ones you see here which does not recognize rules or regulations or a code of conduct where you see women almost naked and they are shouting my dress, my choice. That is not the freedom we are talking about. That's wrong kind of freedom. Here is regulated freedom. Regulated freedom. And uh, it says, the Bible says this very clear, that there's no human being who has never been under a master. So you, you only change from one captivity to another captivity. You read with me uh, Romans 6.18. That's where you discover there the Bible teaches you don't ever pray that you are irresponsibly free. Nobody is uh, free. Boundlessly free. No. There's nothing like unbounded freedom. All freedoms are regulated. They are parameters. So here, Romans chapter 6 and verse 18 uh, says these words. And having been set free from sin, do you see the next one? Having been set free from sin, you became a slave of righteousness. So what is that verse saying? You will never be free. You will always be a slave. But the question is what kind of slave? To what? Are you a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness? Those are the only open option in religious freedom. We don't have multiple like the school children which have A, B, C, D or sometimes E. We only have A and B. It's either you are a slave to sin or a slave of righteousness. That's the iron of freedom. You are never free. You only change the masters. Either the master called sin or the master called righteousness. And in the internal freedom we are talking you move from the freedom of sin and then become a slave of righteousness so this is what we uh, we can say about the internal one and because of that that is what is the most basic emphasis of the church when it comes to public affairs and religious liberty it must lead people to know that you have been made free. You have been made free. And that's where now Galatians chapter 5 comes with a caution. It comes with a caution, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 3. Uh, we get there a very interesting uh, caution in that case. If you have understood how religious freedom is the internal religious freedom the freedom from sin and its in, and its addictions and enslavement you are free and you become a slave of righteousness therefore verse 5 says stand fast therefore in the liberty which Christ has made us free he has made us free from sin but made us under, mean become slaves of righteousness. Therefore, it says, for by the spirit we eagerly wait for the hope. Oh, hey, what, which one is this? No, no, no. Uh, let me read from mine. It says, stand fast therefore. 
you understood how you were a slave, what you were doing when you were a slave, and thank God he has set you free. Be free indeed and stand firm. Tunzaio. That freedom, it is to be generously guarded. Otherwise, you can easily slip back to that other slavery. So it is a slavery that you need to watch, to nurture, to grow, to strengthen. That's why verses like that say, may you be rooted in the love of God. Be rooted. Take root. That's how we do these things. And all the activities of the church, whether it is Pathfinder program, children program, camporees, singing here, and everything, all the programs are there to help you take root in the righteousness of Christ. So that you are safe. You are not tossed here and there. Today, you are enjoying sin. Tomorrow, you are out there. So it says... Stand firm, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not entangle, do not get entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Don't go back to that sin. Basically, we can take the whole day talking about, but basically, that's what we call internal liberty that everyone needs first and foremost. Then now, because you have chosen this yoke of righteousness, you become a disciple, you become, you belong to a department, women ministries, you are going to announce this, Satan is going to challenge that. He's going to limit that freedom that, that you are enjoying. And that brings out the external freedom where now we need the legal system and that's why we, need, we, we saw the lawyers here. They are the ones who want to see that if there is individuals or corporations or governments which try to limit this freedom that we got at the cost of Jesus' class blood, they must defend it. They must defend it. Defend the children from being mistreated because of religion. Defend the women uh, from being forced to recant their faith. Defend the, the men, you know, here. Defend men and women and people against employers who would want to, 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 to interfere with the religious liberty we have got, the internal one, this one that we have been released and we are enjoying here, Jesus Christ, now there comes a challenge and that is where the religious liberty comes in to ensure as much as it is possible that religious uh, freedom in the church, in the home, in the country is taken care of. So that people enjoy religious freedom without hinder or let. Let me finish with this uh, story, and you know it. How do we manage? How do we manage external freedom when it has been infringed into, and we have used all these systems? And God tells us, "I know certain infringements you may not handle." In Acts chapter 12, we are told about uh, Peter. All the, the church, you know, it was not the government of the day. It was the church of the day tried to infringe into his freedom and said you can't preach that gospel. You can't preach that righteousness. You can't preach that freedom you are enjoying. And we are going to jail you if you insist and they insisted, and they was jailed. So how did the religious leap at work? You know, when you do not have the legal system, the legal environment that is going to have, sometimes we have legal governments, we have legal institutions, like the courts and uh, all these things, but sometimes 
People begin to be persecuted because of the freedom they have and there's no legal environment. And God has also provided. And they have given the church that chance. And I want to give one example and then put together and we finish this. So in Acts chapter 12, uh, this is how religious liberty worked. How the church participated in religious liberty. Verse 5, you read verse 1 uh, all the way to verse 4, it takes you that Herod decided to jail Peter because Peter was enjoying religious freedom inside and was preaching it. So he put him in prison. Verse 5 says, Peter was therefore kept in prison. Now how did the church work for his religious liberty? It says here, it's very interesting. It says, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. You see religious freedom here? They are here. How the church participates in religious freedom when the legal environment cannot help. Here the legal environment could not help. So the church came in and then they said Peter is in jail but we must we must intervene. And then they said they kept constantly in prayer and God intervened by sending an angel and they released Peter without the, the security officers realizing it. He went through this door and this door and went out and began to, uh, to preach the freedom he has. So we are seeing that the church should be aware that there is religious freedom in one way or the other. And sometimes we do not have the power to go to this family and tell them, don't persecute this young man, don't persecute this young woman for accepting the faith. What we can do is we can intervene with constant prayer of the whole church or a group on behalf of those people who are being persecuted. It's a big ministry. It's happening every day. We should not be occasional in the intervening of religious liberty. Let's be there constantly. Let us have uh, programs through public affairs and religious liberty. It should not be waited until the last Sabbath of every January. It must be every day. Have a team, Tom, where you can have people uh, in the... In the, in the intervening through prayer of people who are being persecuted because of the religious freedom. So to finish and put together we have two types of freedom. The one is internal which deals with the slavery, meaning freedom from the slavery of sin. That one is done by Jesus Christ himself. We only acknowledge we are sinners and he gives us freedom from sin. Then from here, when we are enjoying the internal freedom, then the governments, the people, the circumstances may begin to infringe into that freedom. That is why we have structures like a department, public affairs, and religious liberty that can lead the whole church to intervene like the one in the first century intervened on behalf of Peter. So it's my appeal that we cooperate with public affairs and religious liberty to intervene with millions and millions of people who are persecuted because of their faith. Not only in Kenya, but in Somalia, in Ethiopia, other places in the East, even in, 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 in Europe now, people are being persecuted. And we have here through public affairs and religious liberty to begin a ministry, a prayer ministry constantly for 
the liberation of the people in jails. As we talk, there are many people who are in jails. There are people who have been kicked dead because of expressing religious freedom. And the church in Kenya, because we are enjoying that freedom for both internal and external, let us begin ministries that will uh, 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 enable that. But finally, is, uh, we, may not, uh, we may not prevent external infringement to freedom, but as much as we can, let's do it. And let us also know, even Kenya, which now is cherishly protecting all religions, will one day come according to prophecy when all those walls will be broken down. Let's know what we shall be doing right from now when the time is good. Otherwise, I want to read again, stand firm in the liberty in which Jesus Christ has set you free. And don't go back to that uh, enslavement and God will help us to work for the freedom of others and ourselves until we come again and we see him in glory. God bless you in Jesus' name.